proof of reincarnation. When I Was Someone Else by Stefan Alex. Historical documentation, pictures, and corroboration by the family. Meeting John Mack was uh, one of the key moments of my life because uh, I, I start I start to work on a subject. Uh, it, those were real phenomena worth to investigate. Stefan is French. I would love you to pronounce your name before we start, just because. Stefan Alex. You have a wonderful accent. You also have a tremendous book. When I Was Someone Else, The Incredible True Story of Past Life Connection. Extraordinary because we have lots of stories, at least in the Western world, of children, of young adults. But we do not have as many of the adult stories. And this one, absolutely astounding. The number of things that you could go through and reconcile. I want to start with your history. This is something that I think sets the tone. From a kid, you wanted to be boots on the ground, war photographer. Why? Well, I think there is many answers to that question. Uh, when I was 19, um, I decided to quit school and to join uh, the Mujahideen, who was at the time fighting the Russian in Afghanistan. It was the, the, the time where the Soviet was occupying Afghanistan. It was uh, 30, 33 years ago. Uh, at, at the time, I really don't know. Uh, I, I think I was following the, the path of my father, who, who was a geographer and who, who did travel in Central Asia in the 50s. So probably that was a, one of the reasons. But I think I really wanted to become a war photographer uh, because I was fascinated by this, um, this place, the, the, those front line. I was just fantasizing the, the being on the front line. Uh, I had a lot of admiration for a war photographer, American war photographer in Vietnam. And uh, I wanted to be like those men. I mean, I mean, it was just cool. And uh, um, when I started doing this job, when I first went in, in, uh, in my first war zone, it was uh, Afghanistan in 1988, um, suddenly the reality uh, appears in front of my eyes. And it was very different from what I saw on the film before. I discover uh, fear, I discover violence, I discover the craziness of a war zone, but I discover also a brotherhood uh, among the people who were fighting for their freedom. And really this first trip, I was, I was quite young, I was 19 at the time, it really changed my life. I mean, it, it, uh, it teach me so much things that I could not have learned in uh, journalist school that I, 33 years ago, I don't regret one day of this, uh, this, this journey. Well, and from that, you went to see the Dalai Lama. Oh, it was a long, long, long time because uh, uh, since I, I haven't been at school, I needed to, make, to do my proof on the field. So I decided to cover a lot of subjects that I was fascinated by. War was one of them, but also the Tibetan issue because the, the Tibetan uh, uh, case is, is a, a very, very powerful subject. And the, the Dalai Lama flew... Uh, in India, escaping Tibet in 1950 uh, something and uh, 59, and um, I was interested in, in all Asia uh, geopolitical issue and Tibetan issue was one of the most important ones. So, uh, in 19 in 89, I, I flew to India. I went north in Dharamsala, and uh, I was very young. I was just uh, 20 at the time, but everybody believed I was a journalist when I introduced myself as so. And I asked for an interview with the Dalai Lama. He, he was just awarded a couple of weeks before a Nobel Peace Prize. Mm. And uh, people believe me when I say I was a journalist and uh, I was half a journalist. So they allowed me one hour interview with the Dalai Lama. It was the first person, uh, renowned person that I could interview. And step by step, month after month, year after year, I started to become more specialized in the uh, uh, Asian issue, Asian geopolitics, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia. And I start to work on a, a more uh, complicated uh, field because when you are a freelance journalist, you need to go uh, where other journalists don't go. So you need to go in a complicated area or uh, to work on a very complicated topic. So I decided to work uh, in uh, on, on a drug trafficking and uh, opium trafficking from Afghanistan, Central Asia. And um, to, to, to tell you the truth, I mean, it's, it's because of her American journalist that I start this. Uh, you, you probably know Larry Collins, who wrote a couple of bestsellers like uh, Or Jerusalem or uh, Paris Burning. 
uh, he, he was a journalist from Newsweek, and uh, he, he, in the 60s and 70s, he started writing a bestseller book about history. And um, he was also living in France part of, part of the time. His, his wife was French. And uh, uh, one day, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to work for him. So I met him, and uh, this uh, Larry Collins uh, pay for my work in, in Central Asia for months and months or investigation on the field about drug trafficking. So it, it helps me to, to become um, quite aware of the topic. And I published my first book about this uh, 20 years ago. Well, okay. I want to switch from that to from there, you developed your own, your, basically your own calling and started doing, uh, I think you're still involved with that, the research for extraordinary experiences. And uh, from there, what? this is a big leap from being on the front line and nearly dying and putting yourself there. Where I mean, That would be frightening to me, just absolutely nerve wracking, not knowing whether you're going to see the next day. No matter what you call yourself, you're in, you're in harm's way. So how did that change from there being that, you know, type A personality, extreme experience to looking for something a little more substantial and maybe long, long lived? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very basic question. And I think it's a key question. Why in our life, sometimes we start to be interested in a topic that normally don't uh, are seen as a serious topic. Uh, life after death, uh, extraordinary experience, unex unexpected experience, spirituality. Uh, usually we, we just leave that uh, aside in your life and we, 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 we try to find a job, a rational job, which we try to find a, um, a, a normal life. And for me, uh, it happens in 2001, six months before 9-11. I was again in Afghanistan at the time and I was working on the archaeological survey of uh, uh, the Buddhist site of Afghanistan. It was during the Taliban regime. Mm. And uh, one morning with my team, we had a car accident. We were driving south of Kabul with two car. And uh, the car, when I was not in, um, just had an accident. And the four person inside uh, were killed. And one of those person was my brother, my young bro brother, Thomas. Mm. And this moment was, of course, um, one of the key moments of my life. Uh, I've been, at this time, I was journalist for nearly 15 years. And uh, the shock of, the, of, of being confronted with death, the shock of being obliged to call my parents from Kabul to tell them their son were killed, uh, all this shock um, really shake me. And uh, it really... Uh, it's like it's like if it was a kind of a reboost of my life. I don't know if this term is correct in English. Um, uh, I was re reloaded in some way, and suddenly I I remember that question like, what are we doing here on Earth? Uh, what is consciousness? What's happening after death? Is that possible to answer rationally to those questions? Uh, suddenly all these questions became very, very, very important. And I decided to, to dedicate 100% of my time to it. I was a journalist. I was aware of um, a way to do an investigation. I was uh, doing it very rationally. I was able to do a, a very serious uh, uh, yeah, investigation. And I decided to, to use those tools, who was mine, to investigate the, 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 the topic of life after death. Do we know that? I mean, I just went to see one physicist, a second one, a neuroscientist, and step by step I was questioning them, what do we know about consciousness? What do we know about what's happening uh, when we died? And to my surprise, to my very big surprise, I realized that uh, the certainty in which we live is not so certain. We don't know what's happening when, when we are dying. Uh, it's, it's a kind of religious belief to say that there is nothing after death. It's a rational belief, but it's not the truth. It's not a scientific uh, truth. So when you're studying this and you are getting involved, and one of the films you did from what, what I saw was on John Mack, which was on alien abduction experiences, and I think he died shortly after you started. But that is completely opposite of what you started with, looking at extraordinary experiences as well. How did you feel after yeah. that experience? Oh, it was, it was, you know, meeting John Mack was uh, one of the key moments of my life because uh, 
after my, my brother died, uh, I started investigating those uh, unexplained phenomena. And I discovered very quickly that all those phenomena were real. I mean, UFO, life after death. And those were real phenomena, worse to investigate. Stefan Alex, when I was someone else, Wendy's Coffee House. From extraordinary experiences like UFO experiences and life after death, we go into reincarnation. One of them was in front of me, and I knew instantly his name was Alexander. And I knew instantly he was a, a rank in the military SS called Obersturmführer, which is a lieutenant. I don't speak German. When I was someone else, Stefan Alex and his incredible story of reincarnation, investigating extraordinary experiences might have been a launching point for this. My only condition was to do it seriously. So when I start to hear about UFO, uh, like most of the people, I believe it was just a, a not very serious topic. But very quickly, when I start investigation, I discover it was a very, top, very serious topic. We had the official service in, in France uh, on the space uh, agency who is studying this. And uh, step by step, I discover people like John Mack, but many other who were working on this field, who doesn't seem to be um, a stupid person. I mean, John Mack was a professor of psychiatry at Harvard. Um, and when I first met him, I was very impressed by the, the, the seriousness in which he, he I mean, the, the seriousness of his work. He was not saying, oh, the UFO are here, uh, the people are taking, uh, the alien are taking people. He was saying, basically, those people cannot invent that story. I know everything about mental illness. Those people are not mentally ill. They're speaking like uh, about a real event that seems to to be real for them and uh, just for that reason you, you you should listen to them and when you start listening to one experiencer a second one a third one etc etc you realize that there is a kind of a common line common description among all those experiencer all over the world and step by step i mean you do you i mean i i did my job as a journalist i asked question I try to cross the information I get. I try to verify if people are lying to me, if people are crazy or whatever. And um, and I can just, uh, yeah, I mean, do my job. And it's so exciting. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that was a fantastic and is a fantastic aspect of your career. Then you decide to take some downtime. Obviously, doing all this can get kind of hectic and maybe, you know, you need re address why you're here you go to the amazon what brought that on exactly D during my my investigation on life after death i also became interested in uh, traditional knowledge like shamanism or the tibetan book of the dead for instance mm -hmm. and i found to my surprise that those traditional knowledge even though they are not scientific they can give you a an, um a very interesting view on on uh, some aspect of consciousness so i start uh practicing shamanism in Peru uh, in 15 years ago. And I used to go there every two years, something like that. Because, um, yeah, in, in my life as a, as a TV producer, writer, I had a very, very frantic time sometimes. And uh, a couple of years ago, I really decided to have a break just to do a life review, as I said. And I went to Peru for that because I knew the the isolation in a shamanic uh, environment could really allow me to connect myself to the, okay, uh, I, I've done a lot of good things, I'm proud of it, I, I, I appreciate it, but do I want to do that the next 20 years? Maybe I will change something. So really it was a kind of uh, intense life review that I was looking for. So I went there in Peru and um, basically I was just isolated in a little house in the forest it's there that the, a very unexpected uh, um, experience happened. Well, you have your routine set up where you're walking down to the river and you're not really into the ayahuasca experience the way a lot of people might assume. This is a different trip. And you're going down to the river and so one day this changes everything. Yeah, I, I, as you said, I was not under ayahuasca. I used to, to, to take ayahuasca when I was going in Peru, but this time I was on a very low... Uh, 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 journey. I was, I was calm. I was just being relaxing, meditating, uh, being alone and uh, doing some exercise, physical exercise. And the shaman just opened a diet in me. Uh, open a diet means I was eating very specific food and I was taking a master plant, which is in shamanism, a plant that is not psychoactive, 
but it's a plan that the spirit will teach you in a dream or in a vision or a daydreaming. I mean, it, it's not hallucinate, hallucinatic uh, plan. Right. So I was finishing my physical exercise that morning and I decided to, to just lie down and to hear some uh, drumming sound just to do a kind of uh, imagination trip, like a shamanic trip with a, a drum. So I lied, I lied on, on my couch and I put the hair set on my, on my hair and I start playing the drumming, shamanic drumming, boom, 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 boom. And I let my imagination go. Uh, like, uh, okay, let's imagine a scene and we'll see what's happening. I, I was not looking for anything in particular. So I close my eyes and I start imagining myself flying like a bird above the valley. I was in Peru. So I saw the river, I saw the forest. I knew it was my imagination who was making this up. But suddenly I see in my vision, uh, I was not sleeping, I was very conscious. Uh, I see in my vision a couple of dots, black dots on the field. So I thought maybe it would be a vision of some native uh, Indians there. But suddenly um, the landscape became totally white uh, and the little dot was still there, so I fly down and I was suddenly on the ground and those people were not Indian at all. They were German soldiers, they were SS, they were walking behind uh, a tank. One of them was in front of me and I knew instantly his name was Alexander and I knew instantly he was a, a rank in the military SS called Oberstunführer, which is a lieutenant. I don't speak German. I'm not very familiar with that, but I was seeing this scene. I was thinking it was coming from my imagination, but it was very, very intense, very emotionally uh, strong. And suddenly this man in front of me um, received a shrapnel in, in his neck. A shrapnel is, a, is a, a piece of metal from a bomb. And suddenly he was killed by a wound on his neck and he was falling down and the blood was just coming out of his neck. And I was seeing, I was just looking at the scene of him dying. Um, I really didn't know what to think at, at this moment because I really, I was convinced it was just my imagination that was making this scenery up. But I was thinking, oh, maybe it's a, you know, it's a kind of dream that is coming up in front of my mind just to, for me to understand something about violence, something about war. I mean, I was not really thinking really, but I was convinced it was just my imagination. But the scene was intense and the scene lasted for a long, long minute. Alexander was dying and suddenly he was standing up. He was dying again. And um, I saw some other scene of probably him with another man and him with another little girl. So I thought maybe it's his, it's his daughter. And those details were so clear that I thought in my mind, but should I maybe have his name? And suddenly I saw an identity card written in German, Hermann. So I believe, okay, this is Alexander Hermann uh, and his rank in the SS is Oberstunführer. And there was a couple of other, other scenes like that, but the scene of his death was so intense and so precise. I really saw the blood coming out of his, of his neck. So when, it, when the drumming stopped after 30 minutes, I, I was um, in shock. Uh, not because I believe I saw some kind of a past life vision, but I was in shock because of the intensity of the experience. So I write it down in my journal very precisely, just to not forget every detail. And I didn't have access at internet at the time, it was in the forest, but uh, I said, wow, Maybe when I will buy back in, in Paris, maybe I will check on the internet. It would be very funny if uh, one guy was by this name in, in, uh, in the SS. Um, but I was not very impatient because I, I cannot believe it, it would be the case. So my trip in Peru lasted for a couple of weeks. And when I came back in France, I checked. I checked on the internet. And uh, very quickly, I find some what looked like list of uh, German soldiers in the SS. And to my surprise, I find one. One, not two, not five, not zero, but one. One Oberstunführer Alexander Hermann. But believe it or not, at the time, I really believe it was in coincidence. <laughs> because I'm a journalist. I am a, a very Cartesian guy. And uh, 
in between two options, I will always choose the more rational one. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was obvious that my mind did this, uh, I mean, create this scenario for a therapeutic purpose or whatever. I mean, when you are a, uh, on a psychoanalyst uh, coach, you can imagine many scenes and those scenes may be uh, consistent with what you are living, what you are going through uh, on your unconscious or whatever. So I, I just believe it was a kind of psychoanalyst vision. But it wasn't. And that's what the story's about. Wendy's Coffee House, Stefan Alex, you have a lot of patience with this because you gave a little time before you actually started doing any research. I keep like that for um, this story far away from me for more than one year. For some reason, I don't know. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know really. Uh, one year and a couple of months after, I start again my, my research on, on the internet and I went a little bit further than the, the first one previously. And I find the name of a historian in France who was specialized in this uh, World War II period. So I call him and to my luck, uh, he knew my name because I, I, I produced a TV program uh, a couple of years ago. So he, he have seen it and he said, oh, I know your name. I know who you are. I know your series when I tell him my story. Mm -hmm. And he, he advised me to, to look if there was some military file uh, because the SS uh, keep a lot of uh, file. I mean, the German were known for their bureaucratic uh, um, procedure. And uh, it appears that there is a lot of archive from this time. And he gave me the name of a French researcher who was at the time working in Washington because those archives, they are both in Berlin and in Washington. So I, I contacted this historian and after a couple of hours, he answered me and he said, yes, I found a file, a military file by the name of Alexander Amann, Oberstundführer. And um, he sent it to me a couple of days after. And uh, of course, I don't speak German, as I told you. So I was very embarrassed because, uh, I mean, I start to try to, to read what was written very, very, uh, in a very complicated way. I tried to translate it with Google Translate. I mean, it was very complicated. <laughs> yeah. And I spent the entire day trying to make something of this 78 page of a military file from, uh, from uh. World War II. But I sent also the copy to the historian. And very late that night, the historian in France sent me an email and uh, he, he just told me the, the basic information that was in, in the file and said, this guy was born in this place. He was uh, engaged in this regiment in the, in the SS division. He was stationed there. He was in France at this time, blah, 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 blah. And then he died in Russia. And we have this, uh, is a birth death certificate, sorry. And this death certificate said that this guy was killed by a uh, shrapnel in the neck. And when I read that, I was uh, exactly at the same place I am now. And I was really in shock, like a, a truck just uh, drove over me. Because the name, the surname, the rank in the SS, okay, it still could be a coincidence, but not the way he died. Because this vision was so clear in my mind. I mean, I saw his face, I saw his neck, I saw the wound in his neck, I saw the blood coming out. And suddenly in this uh, paper, coming from the archive in Washington, coming from uh, front line in Russia in 41, uh, it's written really in German, this guy was killed the way I saw it. So really from this very moment, I understood that it was not a psychoanalyst uh, vision coming from my unconscious. It was something very mysterious and I, I must investigate that. Again, the book is When I Was Someone Else. Stefan, Alex, when you have done this because of your background as a reporter, as a journalist, you dot the I's and cross the T's. The this, this story is absolutely impeccable. You tie your memories with the battle scene. And as you walk us through your recovery, you also introduce us to the relatives and you meet them at some point as well. And they show you pictures to say, OK, who is this trying to trip you up? What was that like? Oh yeah, that was that was a very very emotional moment because, uh, of course, as you say, I, I went to to Germany. I tried to find a place where uh, this guy have lived. I tried to understand his uh, his um, why he became an SS because uh, I mean why a normal guy born in a loving family become a monster. I mean, and if this guy was me before, I want to understand that because it's it's so uncomfortable. I was so uncomfortable with that, Wendy. I mean, it yeah. was. Uh, yeah. It was so difficult for me because I'm a good man. I mean, I, 
Uh, I'm not racist. I'm, uh, I try to be as good as possible. As a journalist, from the very first time, I really wanted to do my job to, um, to explain the complicated situation to people in France. I wanted to understand why people go to war. I don't, wanted to understand, I wanted to bring light to um, shadow of the world. Mm. So suddenly I realized that I could have a kind of link with a guy who was the deepest shadow of the world mm. from this so the biggest evil regime in the world, the Nazi regime. So uh, I was worried. My wife was very, very worried. I was very uncomfortable with that. I was not thinking to write a book at the time. I was just willing to find out what was the link, exactly the link with this guy and to make more, more light I was able to do on it. So I went to, to Germany, tried to find if he had a family there still. And I went also to Russia. But when I was in, in uh, Germany, I met some people of his family. And the, the details are really amazing. And I won't go into it because it's, it's all in the book. But uh, yeah. at one moment, I was in front of one of his relatives. And they wanted to test me. Because, I mean, imagine this guy from France is coming and said, OK, I dream of your... Uh, relative who, who was killed in, in, in Russia and um, maybe his reincarnation. I mean, if someone come to my house saying that about my father, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I, yes. won't, I won't welcome him like that. So they wanted to test me and they, 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 they put a picture of uh, Alexander and his brother, who was uh, a picture where they are both uh, on, on the same picture, sorry. And they asked me to, to recognize which one was Alexander. And... Um, Really, at that very moment, Alexander's face was so much in my mind and so much, um, the memory of his, of his face was so much active in my mind that I was not sure uh, my memory was really accurate because uh, I saw the vision in Peru, but after this, I, I saw him again and I remember it, I remember it, I remember it, I remember it so many times that I don't know if my vision is really the same that my memory, uh, uh, what, what my memory make up uh, in the months that follow that. But the thing is that I recognize his brother immediately because mm -hmm. the brother was the other guy I saw in my vision. Mm -hmm. And this brother, I never thought about him. I, I didn't know it was his brother. So I recognized immediately the face of the other man. So I was uh, able to say, okay, the other guy is Alexander because I recognize this guy who is his brother. And the family, they were just looking at each other in shock. Yeah. <laughs> I was right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, that experience, though, when you're talking about the memories and trying to bring this into reality, the interesting connection is the name, your last name, Alex. Yes. That's, that's pretty incredible. Oh, there is so many pretty incredible uh, coincidences like that. You know, what this investigation teach me is that sometimes, uh, I mean, not sometimes, but always universe or spirit guide or whoever, I don't, I don't really know, um, help you when you are uh, looking for an answer in this, let's say, invisible realm. I was helped and I was facing so many signs, so many unexpected uh, help like that. And you, you mentioned my name. I, I don't know if it's a coincidence. I don't know if there is a link or whatever. But yeah, uh, my name is Alex. And at school, my friends were calling me Alex. And uh, Alexander's nickname was Alex. I, I, I don't want to insist too much on that because I think I can make my own story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there were during my investigation so so many other uh, very hard proof that we had a link together, including locating where he was buried and retracing his steps on the anniversary date of his death. Wendy's Coffee House, Stefan Alex. The book is When I Was Someone Else, a story of reincarnation. You really have to read. Here is a clue, a very real clue, that the body is nearby. Uh, as I was walking toward the the, the village. And suddenly, when I exit the village from the east, I had a kind of uh, hand, a uh, physical hand that beat my chest and stopped me. It was very, 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 very uh, 
impressive. So I stopped the car and I went out and there was nothing. There was just a house. So I look around and really after five minutes, I, I was not able to do anything. So I went back in the village and we, I did a couple of investigation for, for, I mean, I did investigation a couple of days there. We, we learned that uh, soldiers were buried under the house I was stopped nearby. People in the village said that uh, some German uh, official came in the village 10 years before and take away all the body from their soldiers to, to regroup them in a commemoratory cemetery 50 miles away. But I was feeling that Alexander was still there. I had this very strong feeling inside of me. I had the feeling he was still under the house I was stopped by. So I had a phone call from this woman who was helping me in, in Germany, who was specialized in, um, in uh, family research. I told her that story and she called the German service who, who was taking care of the dead body in, in the battlefield. And she did her investigation and she called me back a couple of hours ago and she told me, yes, he's still there. Uh, I had the confirmation from the service that they took a lot of body from the field, but not under the house where you have been in front of. And I didn't know what to do at the time. It, it was emotionally very, very tough. Um, when I was there, because uh, it's like, you know, it's, it's very strange. I'm not very open to my own uh, subjective feeling. I, I don't trust too much my intuition. I'm, I'm very mental journalist, uh, a rational journalist, so I, I hardly connect to my emotion. But this investigation forced me to do so. And when I was on the place Alexander died, on the very day he died, I was alone in the forest and I was walking the same path he was uh, walking that day. Uh, it was like two time were mixing together. I don't want to go into quantum physics to explain that. Or Understood. It was very strange because two time were mixing together. At the time I was on my present at that day, but I had also the time of Alexander kind of um, being around me. I was feeling him around me. I was feeling his soldiers, his brotherhood, the violence of the war. It was, it opens my mind and my eyes to uh, the possibility that we are surrounded by so many other um, dimension and reality. And so when you're saying you didn't listen to your intuition and that was something that you hadn't done, it sounds like that has changed a bit since this. Oh, yes. Yes, because I, I discovered that for some some topic like uh, memory of past life or uh, feeling the um, people who, who, who have died, who, who can be close from us, like uh, father, mother, uh, children, science gives us a limited access to this because science is a very limited tool. So I think it's very bad to, to decide that since science cannot solve uh, entirely those questions, we should just leave them aside. I think we can investigate life after death, reincarnation, and all those topics, both with science, but also with our personal intuition, personal subjective feeling. There is tool to study that. And, and you mentioned John Mack in the beginning of our, in, of, your, of our talk. John was not a scientific, he was a psychiatrist. So he developed tools to investigate subjective speech and subject, subjective testimony. And it allowed him to become confident in the idea that uh, aliens were really uh, being around. It was not a proof. It was not a scientific proof. It was a kind of uh, intuitive proof. I don't know if I'm very clear. I'm sorry with my English, but uh, I hope you understand what I mean. Yes, I understand. In other words, so many people are experiencing it. You have to go with that inner knowing. Exactly. There's one thing that set the tone for this when you were in the Amazon. On the river, something appears. Do you have any memory of what happened with that? I'm talking about the Amazon. Yeah, I remember perfectly this. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was, I was in the Amazon, so I was kind of uh, less, um, less all the time thinking there. I was more uh, connected to my to the energy, to whatever was around. I was not using telephone, I was not writing, I, I didn't have computer, I was just uh, alone in the forest for weeks. So it makes me more sensitive to, to 
subtle energy and subtle beings probably and one day yes i was uh, by the river i was taking a bath and suddenly i just i was just sun bathing on, on a rock and suddenly i had the feeling a very deep feeling of a presence nearby me kind of maybe it was a uh, i interpret it as a the presence of an old very old shaman from all time or uh, all indian i don't have any proof of it i just had the still today uh, years after i still have exact the exact feeling i had at the very moment uh, it was so real you know um, I, I use today my my tool as a journalist and it's what i'm trying to do in my book and it's in this book when i was someone else i'm trying to use the tool of our society western society who are rational who can use science i try to use those tool to investigate those unexplained phenomena extraordinary subject but to open also to other tool like shamanic like mediumship like psychic uh, uh, power and i try also to develop it in me but it's a long long journey i'm still working on and uh, step by step i learn more to to differentiate in in what's coming in my mind to differentiate what is from my imagination that is not from my imagination and could be from um, invisible world yeah well you've laid out an extraordinary template this would be a wonderful film but for anybody who knows how film works the details and the magic are in the book i really really enjoyed the story i'm so glad that you are able to transcribe it the photos the images the faces seeing that and then the battle lines it's the timing can you imagine for them from that time to know that we have come to this point in our world we're revisiting some of these things that happened then and i think that's why this is happening how do you think what you experienced will help us going forward this is the reason why i wrote this book because i think this story is on, is not only mine i think the the war and the violence on this earth uh, is still here i mean the the millions of people who have been killed during world war 2 they are still here their suffering the violence is still here it's in me in you in everybody that is listening today sometimes it's a kind of direct link like a past life link sometimes it's other kind of link but i think all work today your work my work as a writer the work of people who are listening to to us it's to to heal in some way this violence and uh, this anger this uh, sorrow we we have the possibility to, to heal it i think human being are a little machine to heal the world so this is why i decided to to write this book and since this book has been published i received so many so many testimony of people who 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 have a same memory who are obsessed by image of war that don't belong to them I think you were able to transmute it by reliving it and releasing it and doing what you did and that is extraordinary and that might be I think where we're all able to go when we figure out where some of these urges are coming from and the violence that you saw that is no longer in you but a part of your reconciliation and I hope that's the right word for you That's that's the right word. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you for your time and I look forward to hearing more from you and learning more about your future. Oh, I'm still writing. I'm still in investigation, uh, investigating a very amazing story. <laughs> Can you say what it is? I'm still interested in the, in the in the relation between brain and consciousness. We live in a world where uh, we believe uh, I mean the majority still believe that brain is creating consciousness, but we have thousand of evidence that it's not the case. So I'm really working on that. uh because uh, it's very interesting and it's worth it to present those evidence thank you for your time thank you very much stephan alex journalist former war correspondent founder of the institute for research on extraordinary experiences and author when i was someone else the incredible true story of past life connection i'll put links on the blog thanks for listening